I'm David Poveda. We are researchers at Contemporary Childhood Research Group at Autonomous University of Madrid in Spain. First of all, we'd like to thank organizers for allowing us to be part of the panel, and we are also very sorry for not being able to be with you physically. Today, we would like to make a methodological presentation titled Photographs as an Elicitation Technique and Data Source in Research with Children. The purpose of this presentation is to discuss how we have used photographs in our research with children and to especially show some of the complexities and potentialities that come with use of photographs. Our presentation will focus on the four points shown on the slide. So from our perspective, the use of photographs in social science research can be categorized in two ways. Photographs can be a data source in themselves relying on images and its visual data that speaks for itself as a source of information. Or, photographs can use as a tool to elicit responses from informants through interviews or other sources of data. Photographs are often taken for granted in, as objects in daily life, but it is important to recognize that they can help us reveal aesthetic, ethical, and ideological values in participants, social group, the photographs also reflect the photographer's point of view, the biases of the photographer, and the knowledge of the person that took the photograph. And the meanings of a photograph is something that is constructed by the maker and the viewer of that photograph. And these meanings can change over time or across context, which is something very important in research with children. Photographs are seen to have the following advantage in research with children. In short, it is fast and easy to be collected. It allows the researchers to step outside a prescribed authority role, such as of teacher. It can establish rapport with children, and also photographs provide insights into children's perspectives. There are challenges too. In this presentation, we attempt to uncover some of the complexities and tensions in research using photographs. We will do so taking examples from the four projects in which our research group has been involved. The table summarizes the four projects. The first two projects were related to family diversity. And in these projects, we, we asked participants to provide family photos. The last two projects were about children's daily routines. And in these projects, we asked children to take photos following a different set of instructions. So what we want to discuss are different complexities and tensions that we've encountered in analyzing the data and the visual materials for these projects. The first one that we want to discuss is the tension between using photos that are created by participants versus photos that are elicited by researchers. In the first case, when photographs come from the archive of families, what we foreground is the ecological validity or emic relevance of these visual materials. Photographs that were generated, kept, commented, and shared by children and their families before they were used as research materials attempt to uncover some of the meanings that these photographs and visual materials have for children and families. However, these advantages also mean that researchers have very little control over the nature of the materials around the quantity, type, content, etc of these materials. And as we will illustrate in more detail, researchers have to navigate through the potential multiple meanings that these photographs have for different participants, or the changing meanings of these photographs over time. Our research project with diverse families, especially with the adoptive families, illustrates some of these potentials and complexities. On the one hand, in relation to adopted families, Photographs and the, and the importance of photo albums is something that is underscored in different strands of the literature. And using visual materials with adopted children may help researchers work through some of the silences, to use an expression used in Spanish research, that surround adopted families. Topics, experiences, and feelings that are not easily talked about or emerge easily in daily conversations. However, given these conditions, the same photographs can encapsulate very different meanings and emotions for different family members and serve different social functions. As an illustration of this, we have the photograph 
that we're showing. It comes from an adopted family in the United States. In this family, mother and daughter selected photographs that captured the daily family experiences, and the daughter included the photograph. She's in the middle between her older biological brother and sister, with whom she has a relationship as she was op adopted through an op open adoption. During, during the interview with Aisha, a pseudonym, the importance of these siblings in her life was underscored, and she selected this photograph to emphasize this relationship. However, later, during the interview with the mother, it transpired that, at least from the mother's point of view, the relationship with the biological mother and family was at times problematic and, ca and a cause of tension for the mother and the adopted family. On the other hand, when photographs are generated by participants following some type of instruction from the researcher, the goal is to gain some control over the nature of the elicited photographs by providing guidelines or constraints of some sort. However, given that usually these photographs are generated within qualitative and open-ended research projects, there is variability across participants, and this is something that needs to be considered in the analysis. Our research on children's routines illustrates well some of these issues. For example, as the task of taking photographs was transferred to families, in some families, children had most responsibility over the process, while in others, most photographs were taken by parents. This introduces important differences as parents primarily capture their children engaged in activities, while if children take the photographs, the focal child will never appear in the photograph. These contrasts often reveal important but subtle differences in what children consider significant aspects of their daily lives and how these should be captured. For example, the two photographs that we're showing apparently depict similar scenes, children playing in their rooms. But the first one, was taken by the parents of the children and depicts the three siblings playing together in something that could be seen as what parents consider quality evening time in their family. In contrast, the second photograph was taken by the older sister, the focal participant in the study, and primarily can be seen as a reflection of her re relationship with her brother and the importance of their brother in her life. The second complexity and tension deal with the analytical logic applied to the analysis of the photographs and visual materials. Broadly speaking, we have analyzed photographs using two guiding metaphors which, for the goal of this presentation, fit negatively well with Bruner's distinction between narrative and paradigmatic reasoning and thinking. From a narrative perspective, photographs contain and tell stories that help locate and organize events and participants in particular places and times. Again, these stories are not self-evident in the visual artifact and must be uncovered through conversation and work with the photographs with participants. Further, following classic distinction in narrative analysis, conversations around the, around the narratives articulate the division between the narrated event, the original event, an episode captured in the photographs and the narrative event, how this event is retold, reinterpreted in subsequent conversations and encounters around the photograph. For analytical purposes, understanding the narrative event around photographs is a key issue. It allows to understand how the meaning and personal relevance of the same materials might change over time for individuals or might be different for different participants. In a study of children's routines, we have tried to focus on the habitual mundane, and thus the focus has been on examining collectively sets of photographs that together document children's daily and weekly routines. It allows to uncover the meaning and importance of these routines, and also more objective aspects of these routines, such as where, with whom, with what materials, when, etc., children engage in different routine activities. In our studies with adoptive families, in contrast, our focus on extraordinary moments in participants' lives, and we have facilitated that participants select photographs that condense important relationships and emotions in their lives. Consequently, more interpreted work and meaning can be extracted from individual photographs. The example illustrates some of these features. 
It was selected by adopted adolescent and portrays her and her cousin sleeping in strollers during a walk in a family reunion trip. The photograph was taken when they were toddlers, so most probably the stories around the photograph are not drawn from her individual memories of the event. Rather, as transpired during the conversation, what provides meaning and personal relevance to this photograph are the stories told by her parents and other family members, the relationship that has developed since then with her cousin, or the accumulated meaning of successive family reunions, that is, narrative events taking place after and beyond the photograph. Photographs can also be examined from a paradigmatic perspective as encapsulating structural relations visible in the composition and organization of the elements in the visual materials. There are at least a couple of analytical advantages in this approach. On one hand, there are established procedures that have been specifically developed for visual materials and thus avoids the problems associated with adapting and stretching concepts and procedures developed in other fields such as linguistic narrative analysis as in the case above. On the other hand, it might be also easier to bring into analysis concepts and issues developed in different areas in social theory that are also organized as paradigmatic theories. Our use of this structural approach is best illustrated in how we use family photographs in the study of single mother by choice families. We analyze these photographs and the posters through the tools and lenses in line with the above discussion. On one hand, compositional visual analysis as developed by Bonzac. On the other hand, the definition of family and kin relations developed by Trost. The procedure allowed us to identify how children build their own individual system of family relations and as a result we have been able to study single parent and two parent families formed in different ways adoption biological reproduction remarriage etc example 5 illustrates both the resulting visual artifact and the analysis layered over it okay so some conclusions in this talk, we've reviewed some of the reasons why photographs have been used in research with children and young people, and we then illustrated how we've used it in our research, underscoring some of the tensions and dilemmas we've encountered. We'd like to close the presentation highlighting a few more general conclusions regarding the use of photographs. First, from our perspective, photographs have the advantage of being a very flexible material and data source in research. As we have shown, Photographs can be collected under very different conditions or recovered from photographic archives and families. Analysis can draw on a relatively large set of photographs or gather rich information from a single photograph. In short, there are no guidelines in terms of the characteristics or quantity of images that have to be gathered to be useful and valid for social research. In addition, from our perspective, Using photographs does not require strong commitment to any particular theoretical paradigm. And analyzing photographs and visual materials benefits greatly from combining available analytical, analytical approaches, or even better, generating new ideas and tools to analyze photographs. So that would be flexibility as the first conclusion. Second, a recurrent theme that we've discussed through the different projects is that the analysis often needs to move beyond the photograph and use interviews and other sources of data to understand the meaning, relationships, and dynamics behind these photographs. Indeed, we would generally think this is the way to go with photographs in ethnographic and qualitative research with children and youth. However, the role of photographs as a source of more objective information should not be disregarded. And this is our second point to stress here. Even in qualitative research projects, what photographs objectively contain is difficult to disregard. We can neither ignore or minimize the importance of themes and aspects that recurrently appear in photographs, nor would it be easy to introduce unless we have very strong arguments to do so, as relevant themes, things that are never captured in children's photographs. And finally, I would like to stress that within the growing body of visual and multimodal research with children and youth, the place of photographs and digital cameras can be underscored as the more lo-fi 
approach and digital device. Photographs and digital cameras are easy to use, simple and relatively cheap. And they don't require sophisticated skills on the part of participants to produce photographs or excessively complicated setups to be used productively in research. Yes, there's very interesting and valuable research we're currently, currently going on using video, multimodal analysis, video edition, and other sophisticated digital setups. However, photographs might be a very good place to start experimenting with visual materials if you want to keep research simple. Thank you. Thank you.